this morning, my sermon is titled, Healthy in Body, Strong in Spirit. Healthy in Body, Strong in Spirit. And this title is taken from um, Todd John, uh, chapter 1 from verse 2, when John was writing a, a letter to one of the church members, and I read it to you. Uh, it reads, Dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that you are as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. So the Lord wants to speak to us today that as a Christian, we need our body to be in health as much as we strive to also uh, make our spirit to be strong. We live, and I can say we have an intertwined lives. We have our physical life. We also have our spiritual life. Even though our spiritual life is chief, is the most important one or more important of the two, but our physical life is no less important. Paul, when he was writing to Timothy in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, Paul wrote to Timothy saying, physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. So there is a, uh, there is a mutual reciprocity in our physical life and our spiritual life, that our spiritual life must be healthy as much or as also our spiritual life is strong. Our spiritual life, as I mentioned unto you, is chief because it is transcendental. It, it goes beyond this world. It is in this world and in the world to come. But you will agree with me that we also need a sound body. We need a healthy physical life to be able to thoroughly do the work of the spirit. So we cannot let one suffer uh, to, to, to the detriment of the other. We cannot attend to one and neglect the other. We cannot nurture our physical life so much that we are just eating and we're just sleeping and we're just doing things of the physical and not taking care of our, nurture, our, of our physical life, that also will, will put us as a, at a disadvantage. Likewise, we can uh, nurture our spiritual life to the detriment of our physical life because we must know that our Lord God is the Lord over our entire body. So either in the physical or in the spiritual, we must nurture them as unto the Lord. Amen. My, the point of my message to us today is that we also need to maintain a healthy uh, lifestyle. We must, we must take care of our body. As we read our Bible, as we pray, as we nurture our spiritual life, as we nurture our spirit, we also need to pay attention to what we eat, what we drink, how we take our rest, how we nurture our physical body. Because we know for sure that we can only do anything that is spiritual in this physical body that we have. And as much strength, as much ability we have in the body, that is how much thoroughly or how much more of the spiritual uh, activities that we can undertake. So the Lord is going to use his word to speak to us so that we don't neglect our body. We don't uh, just live life as if the body doesn't really matter as if our physical well-being is secondary to everything else and we only come back to it when something happens to it. We don't want to get to that place that we are rudely 
awaken to taking care of our body. So let's go first in the book of Leviticus. We will see that there are clear instructions for healthy living because God wants to preserve uh, our us from, from diseases and from health issues, from health uh, problems. When God took his uh, people, the children of Israel, from Egypt, he gave them all these laws. He didn't just give them spiritual laws about how to pray, about how to worship him. He also gave them laws and instructions and principles that, that would enable them to maintain a healthy body and also a healthy environment. So let's open our Bible to uh, Leviticus 18. Leviticus chapter 18. I will read unto us verse 3. Leviticus 18 from verse 3. Do not act like the people in Egypt where you used to live or like the people of Canaan where I am taking you. You must not imitate their life, their way of life. Do not act like the people in Egypt where you used to live or like the people of Canaan where I am taking you. You must not imitate their way of life. That means we are unique to God. We are citizens of heaven. Not our home country, not our adopted country, but the country of heaven. So God wants want us to know that a healthy body makes our service to God more effective. We live in a country where everything that is about the body is just pushed to the background. It's a rat race. It's how to get the next thing, how to be uh, at the next place. But God said we must open our eyes to his word in his book and live our life accordingly so that we can maintain a healthy body. Amen. And secondly, and I'm sure this will be very interesting to you, that to know that living a healthy life is a way of holiness. Would you have thought about it? That for me to maintain a sound body is also about holiness. You might be wondering, okay, let me show it to you in the word of God. Let's open to the same Leviticus, uh, chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11, I'll read for you for, uh, verse 45. For I, the Lord, am the one who brought you up from the land of Egypt, that I might be your God. Therefore, you must be holy because I am holy. Leviticus 18, 45. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy for I am holy. When you look in this chapter, chapter 11, it wasn't talking about the tabernacle or worship or prayer. It was talking about food. It was talking about the type of food you need to eat to, make, to, to give you a sound body. The type of food to not eat to give you a sound body. It was talking about just maintaining community health. And God brought in holiness into it. That means we can't just munch on anything we, we see or just put in our body anything that is offered unto us. So living a healthy lifestyle is a form of holiness. If you do not know that before today, now you see it and you know it is in the word of God. In chapter 11, when you get home, you can read more about it. God brought in holiness when he was talking to his people just about food, about what to eat, and what not to eat. Lastly, let's look again, uh, Leviticus chapter 15, 
from verse 31. Thus you shall separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. In this chapter 15 too, you will see God was talking about dermatological issues, about your skin disease and anything oozing from your body. Right from the beginning, God was already talking to them about public health. All these six feet apart that we are now hearing, God already instituted it in the midst of his people when they were coming from Egypt. That when somebody has a skin disease, don't get too close to that person. When somebody has a skin disease and it gets on the cloth, make sure you wash it or make sure you burn it. God is already telling them how to take care of contagious diseases so that you don't have infections spreading among you in your camp or in your city or in your town or in your nation. God is concerned about how many times you pray and how many times you fast as much as he is concerned how you take care of your body. How much time you give your body to rest. How, 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 how good food you, you eat. How you drink enough water. How you, you let your mind rest. And you are not just about what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? How am I going to get to the next level? Your mind is not just racing and thinking and thinking and thinking all the time. To just take a breath and, 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 and chill and allow your body to rejuvenate. God is concerned about the soundness of our body. Of our body. So all the public health laws that we have, when you are sneezing, when you have cold, please don't come to work. When you are cold, please don't go in the midst of the people. God, God was already way ahead of us. He said, don't bring your uncleanness to my house or else you will die. That's also holiness. That's holiness unto the Lord. That shows you that healthy in body strong in spirit, all everything is from God. Amen. So that brings us to the, the main issue that I want to raise up and I want, to, uh, I want us to pay attention to today. And that is about rest. Rest. Using the uh, story of Moses, and his father-in-law, Jethro, uh, for the word of God today. So let's go to that uh, chapter, Exodus. Exodus that was read to us during our Bible reading time. Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18. This story very much exemplify the the uh, intertwined relationship between our spiritual life and also our physical life. In chapter 18, here was Moses at 80 years old. And let us see his routine. This is how Moses spends his day from chapter 13. And so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. That was the routine, the uh, clocking time and the clock out time of Moses, from morning till night. Morning in those days is is sunrise when the when night ends and the sky begins to clear so we can say maybe around 536 Moses is already on the judgment seat judging people the bible say till the evening that means till sunset maybe around 9 p.m. give or take this guy was doing more than 12 hours of shift there are some people, that is how they live their life in our day. 
They do 12 hours or they do more than 12 hours of shift. Either in one location or they go from job to job just because the job must be done. And that is what they will be telling you. When his father-in-law observed his routine, this guy was perplexed. And he told Moses, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? And Moses had a perfect excuse for him. When you ask somebody, why are you doing two, three jobs? You say, man, I need the money. Man, there are so many things I need to take care of. Man, I need to pay some bills. There are, they, will, they will give you legitimate reasons. They can even show you, see how much I owe. See how much responsibilities I have. See how many people I'm taking care of. Moses said, I need to judge these people. I need to uh, settle disputes. I need to teach them the word of God. I need to make them to know the way of God. And none of these things in and of themselves is wrong. Why, why wouldn't you settle dispute? If you don't settle dispute, then you are, you are, you are, you are running a, a very uh, a chaotic community because everybody will just be taking revenge on their own. Everybody will take laws into their own hands. So Moses was doing what to him is legitimate. But his father-in-law would have none of that. His father-in-law said, look, the thing that you do is not good. I just wish that God would give us somebody that would tell us the truth when we are just wasting our body away, when we are just reducing our lifespan just because of some earthly responsibilities, just because of some bills that we have to take care of, just because of some people that we think we must feed. Somebody that will wake us up from our slumber. And that is what the word of God is doing today. It's waking you up from your slumber. That you cannot continue to postpone the day that you will give rest to your body. All in the name of, I have responsibilities. Let us look at the damage that Moses was doing. Jethro said, you are not doing yourself good, and you are not doing these people good. One, you are, you are going to exhaust yourself. You are 80 years old, right? Before you know it, you will be like a 120-year-old man because you are exhausted, you are tired, you never gave your body time to rest. So your body is now looking and functioning like the body of a 120-year-old man. That is one. Number two, all these people you think you are judging and you are doing good to, when you are so, number one, you are not able to get to all of them in one day. Therefore, many will be disappointed at you that I have been on the queue since 630 Amen. It was just getting to my turn, and Moses said it was done for the day. I don't know what kind of leader this Moses is. What, what, what does he think he is? He said, People will abuse you, even though you have been working over 12 hours. But just because you are not able to get to their own matter that day, you are now a bad person. So, they, even though you are doing their work, they will still blame you for it. That's one. But then number two, how about somebody who has been on his feet? Over 12 hours, waiting for his turn to just be able to tell you that my neighbor stole my money. Please ask him to return it to me. Just one trivia matter. But this man would wait over 12 hours just for him to bring his case to you. So you are damaging your body. You are also damaging your relationship with your people. God is telling us today that we need to take care of our body. Yes, we have bills to take care of. Yes, we have many mouths to feed. And God said, yes, 
we should open our hand and we should feed people, but not at the expense of the soundness of your body. You are going to wear yourself out. Moses was spending so much time and energy on one job that he was neglecting so many other work to do. Just imagine his relationship with his wife. Moses will probably come in around 10 or 10.30 and just eat dinner and go straight to bed because he needs to wake up by 5 a.m. the following morning to get ready for another day of job. So that means no discussion with wife, no kids, how are you doing, how is your school, how is your business, how is your own marriage, how are your own kids. There's no family time whatsoever. And probably he needs to read his instruction God gave to him to refresh himself so that he will be able to judge the people rightly the following day. He's damaging himself, he's damaging his relationship. How many people have, have, have really driven away so many people from their lives just because they have a job to go to? Or even if the separation is not physical, the, the wife will say, well, we're just living in the same house. I, I don't even know if he's my husband, but he comes home, he goes out, he puts money on the table. I think we should be grateful to God for that. Or the kids will say, I don't even know my daddy. I know somebody, they said I have a daddy. Because by the time he comes home, I'm already sleeping. By the time I wake up to see his face, he's already gone. Day in, day out. And by the time the kid is 18, he says, oh, my son. He says, yeah, you said you are my son. Are you my daddy? I never saw your face for the past 18 years. Damaging body, damaging relationship. You see, in America, we wear being busy as a badge of honor. It's like if you don't tell people I am busy in America, then it's like you are lazy. It's like you're not doing anything. So it's, a, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. That is the song everybody is singing. That nobody has time to do anything. Even nobody has time to eat food, just food by itself. We are eating food, we are on the phone. We are eating food, we are watching TV. We are eating food, we are on a computer. Some people will call it working lunch. That means they are eating lunch and they are still doing work. So you just put food in your mouth and your mouth is, once you put the food in your mouth, the mouth will sense that there is food in, 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 in it and it will just move up and down. It's automatic. But you are not paying attention to the food at all. Being, being matched or being chewed by your mouth and being swallowed, once it gets to your mouth, the body takes over automated until it gets to your stomach. How are you going to enjoy the food? How are you going to enjoy what you are scrolling on your phone? You know, I, I, I tell people that, when people say I'm multitasking, I'm multi you cannot multitask. Your brain can never do two things at the same time. It's impossible. So it's either you are actively doing something and your brain is just the automated part of your brain that is doing the other. But you cannot actively do two things at the same time. It's a fallacy. It's a lie that every one of us we have bought into that in America, you have to be busy. You have to be busy. You have to be doing two things at the same time. Phone, phone in your ear and then you are stewing the pot, your pot or you are making food. It's either I say, I'll call you back, I'm doing a work. Everything has just to be done right now, right now. You can never do two things. It's either you are listening to me or you are on your computer. You cannot say, I'm listening, be talking. I'm listening. You are not listening. You are just hearing me. You are just, my words are just, are just pinging your, your eardrums and they are making sound in your mind. But you are not really following what I am saying. So, work is something that God has ordained. God, it's in the Bible that if you do not work, you must not eat, right? But it is also in the same Bible that God says, 
I work six days, seventh day, I take a rest. It is also in the Bible that God says, you farm this land six years, on the seventh year, in the seventh year, allow the land to rest. So God wants us, our body, to be sound, to be in good health. So we are not just working and working and working all the time. Even when we closed from work and we are going home, we are thinking of what we will do at home. When we get to home, we're thinking of what we'll do in the office tomorrow. When we get to the office, we think of what we will do at home. Our mind is never in the same place that our body is at any time. Our mind is always, always in, 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 in front of us, always searching for the next thing to do, next thing to say, next thing to hold on to, and our body is here. We need to come to a place that our mind and our body, we are in the same place. So when you, when you sit in your living room, don't let your mind be 12 miles away. Let your mind be where you are. Observe your TV. Observe your flower. Observe your chair. Observe your kids. Look at them. Just know how these things are. There are some, we just go in and come on and go in and come on, and then somebody will come to us one day and say, why is your picture crooked like this? He said, ah, I didn't even see it. Because you are just looking every day, you never saw anything. Because you're just looking, but your mind is never there. Your mind is many miles away. Rest for our mind. Rest for our body. Rest for our mind. Rest for our body. In Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 7, all the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the soul is not satisfied. All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the soul is not satisfied. There is another place also that says the more you make, the more mouth will, will, will show up for you to also feed. So we also have, we also fall into this deception of doing more. When we do more, we have more. We do more, we have more. That's why some people, they are never satisfied with just one job. They say, I can't just sit at home. I have to go do work. We can never have more. It's, it's, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a lie of the enemy to just, Keep us in the right race. If you are praying to God for, let's say, $100 to meet all of your needs, the moment you have that $100 in your hand and you are able to meet your need, you say, ah, this Bible is old. Look, all the pages are, I need another one. Your TV will look small to you. Your car will look so old to you. Say, so let me go get another one. Now you get another one, you need 150 to meet all of your needs. That means you need more hours, or you need more job, or you need more this, or you need more that. And that is what we will be striving after until we get to that 150 mark. By the time we get to that 150 mark, there is also something we want to do. It is, it is good to want to live a good life. It is good to want to enjoy life, but not at the expense of our body. Not to, to go from one job only to sleep in the car, to be able to go to another job. That is not a life. All that we are buying, all that we are doing, at the end of the day, what happens to them? What happens to them? So, the word of God is telling us that we need our body to take us far to be able to fulfill the promises and the plan of God for our lives. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 12, the Bible says that people who work hard sleep well, whether they eat little or much, but the rich seldom get a good night's sleep. It is good to be rich, but what the Bible is telling us is that 
You don't allow anxiety to take your sleep away. Anxiety of how to get to the next level. Anxiety about what to eat tomorrow, what to feed on tomorrow, what to wear tomorrow, how to get to the next level tomorrow. That we are worrying and worrying and worrying and worrying. That will not get us to where we, we need to get to. What will get us to where we need to get to, it's only God. Only God makes the provision. Not by our own energy, not by our own power. So God who makes the provision is also telling us that we need to find time to rest. To switch off the TV, to switch off the phone, to just block ourselves and say, this is my own me time. This is my own time. And not the time to now start thinking of what to do. It's just the thing, it's just the time to be in the moment. To breathe in and breathe out and feel your breath in you. When when all of a sudden you catch yourself say hey, that means you have held your breath for some time. That's why your body kick in that you can you cannot breathe on me. I need the oxygen. The bo the body will just kick you out of your slumber. But to be aware of your breathing, that yes, this is me. I am here and I am breathing in and out, in and out at all times. Not to just to forget ourselves and our, our, mind, our brain is doing 100 miles per hour, but our body is here. It, it leads to exhaustion. It leads to tiredness. It just, it leads to worry and just being, being tired of everything. The word of God is coming to us today to make time. Make time to rest, please. There are some days you will need to call your work. I'm not showing up today. I'm resting. They cannot fire you for that. Because the law allows for you to take some days off. Look for that day. Not the day you take off and then you run all the errands that you have been postponing all these days. No. It's a day you take off and you just chill. You just, you just be by yourself. You just be and, and, just, and just be alive. And just be alive. And the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Moses also was doing damage to his relationship. He was doing damage to his relationship. You remember at the beginning of the pandemic when the law was that everybody should stay at home. There, it was in the news that many marriages were falling apart at that time. Why? Because this couple, they have never really lived together, even though they are in the same house. It's just, oh, dear, I will see you later, and it's gone. Oh, how was work today? They just ate dinner together. Oh, I'm so tired. I have a 4 a.m. flight to catch. I have a 8 a.m. meeting at work, so I need to go to sleep now. They were just in the house patching, and they have been married five, ten years. Who knows? Now, pandemic came, stay at home came, they have to live together now, 24 hours a day, and they cannot tolerate one another anymore. They cannot tolerate another. It's either the husband is complaining about the wife that you are disturbing me, or the, the, the wife is complaining about the husband that you are disturbing me, because they have never lived together, truly, truly, as a couple. They have, they have never merged to be one. They have just been two separate individuals just sharing the same space under a roof. Now they are being forced to live together as one. And it was becoming difficult. There were, there were you know, news of people, domestic abuse and divorce, and people say, we are not really compatible. So not taking time to rest is not only for your body, it's also 
for your relationship. Husband and wife, just time a day that you will call off, I will call off, and the kids are all gone to school. Let's just be together, husband and wife, and have our time today. It is healthy. It is healthy. Because in, in, the, in the morning, everybody is buru, buru, buru. you're brushing your teeth, you're showering, you're eating breakfast, you are gone. And then you come back home, you're cooking dinner, and everybody's tired, and you go to sleep. Day in, day You never discover, even your wife is, is having a, uh, uh, something on the body, or you don't take notice because you just look past them. To the next task. You just look past her to the next file that you want to review. But that day, you, you, you rest. You are together. It would do a lot of good for your relationship. So, we thank God, Moses took Jethro's advice. That is, even though this is not the focus of the uh, sermon, but you see the humility that is in Moses. So when God, when the Bible says that Moses was the meekest man on earth, he took the advice of his father-in-law. Moses did not say, look at you. What are you talking? What are you saying? <laughs> Do you know I talk to God face to face? I've been in the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights. So, you're talking about resting? There is no rest. This is the work God has given to me and I must do it. He did not let the ego of his accomplishment or, or the, 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 his, his honor as the, the president of an entire nation to say, you, where are you coming from? Huh? How many people have you led in your life? He listened. We need to listen when people are telling us the truth. We need to listen, especially when it pertains to our life and they have nothing to gain from it. Whether Moses lived long or lived short, it, well, it will concern the father-in-law, but, I mean, it's not going to take away from his own life. But Moses took to that advice and lived another 40 years. We also see in the New Testament, which is where the theme came from. So let's open to uh, Todd John. And this is Apostle John writing to a member of a church. Now we talked about Moses being the leader of, uh, of a nation, but here is just on the opposite end, a member of a church. And the apostle was writing to this member. Third John chapter 1 from verse 2. Let me read from verse 1. Greetings to Gaius, the elder, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. Other translation will say above all things. I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. That you are healthy in your body, as you are also strong in your spirit. We see that this guy is a correct Christian. That his inner life of prayer and fellowship with Father is going on well. Because we can see in the later part of the letter, saying that the brethren testified of the truth that is in you. So he's not a fake Christian. He's not a Christian that doesn't know his Bible or doesn't pray his prayer or is just a, you know, Christmas or, or every once in a while Christian. A solid, correct Christian. But when the apostle wrote to him, it took time to also pray for him that his body will also be sound to be able to continue in the work of the spirit that he has been doing. He's, a, he's strong in the Lord, is active, is an active Christian, 
But as much as I will pray for your soul to be strong, I also pray that you will be healthy in your body. Let us take care of our body. Let us take care of our body. You know, when we were doing praise and worship uh, earlier this morning, the sermon that I had already prepared flashed through my mind, and I just smiled to myself, and I, I said that praise and worship, in addition to uh, lifting our spirit up, is also good for our body. You know what? In what sense? In the sense that we are dancing. We are exercising. You know? I don't want to belittle it and say, oh, now it's your time to exercise. But please, it is a time you can take advantage of it. So, people who just stay in motion in just one place, don't need praise and worship, they are missing out on the fullness of praise and worship. It is time to move around to dance, to make your joints to move, to your heart to pump blood around your body, for your heart to exercise, for your lungs to exercise, for your body to sweat a little bit. So the praise and worship time is doing your spirit life good. It also wants to do your physical life good. So when, when I see some of our youths and it's praise and worship time, they just stay in one place. I say, are you not being moved? If you are not even being moved, okay, dance. Just dance. Let it be for the exercise of your body. But I want us to take care of our body as we, as we uh, hear this message and we go in our daily living for this week. Watch what you eat. Make time for your, for, for your body to rest. Make time for you to exercise. If you cannot go to the gym, you have little space around your living room, or you can just walk around. They call it exercise in place or running in place. You can just be jogging in one spot. Just time yourself and do it day in and day out. As much as God is concerned about the, the nourishment and the nurturing of your spiritual life, he is also Concerned about the nurturing and the uh, 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 and and the soundness of your physical uh, body. Healthy lifestyle is a form of holiness, and this I want to add as I wrap up. So, talking to uh, our youth and those who still have parents, we must. Take care of our parents as well. I tell people that you don't have to be a millionaire to make a monthly contribution towards the uh, sustenance of your parents. You don't have to be a millionaire. Even if it's, you can start with as little as you are able to afford. And maybe every six months and every, every one year, you can add to it. But once you get started, once you get it into your, into your budget, that would, that, that would, uh, it, it would, it will make it easy for you to execute. So that there are, there are some of our elderly that they don't have to work. They don't have to work. They, even, even if they have to work, because again, like I said, being active is good for your body. That's why some people retire, but they take up volunteer work. Because they don't, they don't want to just sit in the house all day. So they're not, it, they're not doing it for the money, but they're doing it for the social aspect of it. They have people to talk to. They have people to argue with. They have people to just you know, share ideas with to keep them active. Yes. So it, they, they are not working because they have to work they have a bill to pay. They have to make ends meet. It, it has to come to a, to a time in the life of a man that has children that your work is not to meet an end. Your work is just an enjoyment for you. It's just, it's just an outlet for you to meet other people, to socialize, and to interact. So 
we must take care of our parents so that when they get to that uh, uh, time of their year, they are going to work and they are coming from work is not with any anxiety or would I be able to make enough to pay my bill for this week or for, for this month? No. It should just be that I, I'm, I'm going to be a substitute teacher because I just love to be with kids. So whether they pay me, they don't pay me, of course they will pay you, but you are not in need for the money. I just want to go to the store and, and, and help them pack stuff, you know, they will pay you, but you are just doing it so you can say, welcome, man, welcome, sir. Let me help you with this and let me help you with that. So as, as children to our parents, we must take care of their, of, their, of their need at a point in their life. So they also can, can rest. They also can enjoy even the remaining years that God has for them. And I... I pray and I hope that we have been blessed by this message this morning. That we must not neglect our health. We must not, there, there are, especially in this country where we have the resources to take care of ourselves. Let's take advantage of that. We have resources. Let's take advantage of that. We, 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 it's, it's not a good thing to be busy all the time. America has clouded us that we just have to say we are busy. Some people at work, they will say they are busy and they cannot do the work. So my question to them is, what are you busy about? That you cannot even the work that you are supposed to do on the job. So if you, are, if you have too much on your hands, just let your manager know that I have too much I'm doing. And they will assess it and give you what is appropriate. But you cannot say you are busy and that you are not doing some work or you are not coming to some meetings or you have to leave early or you just have to just mess everybody else's work up just because you say, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. It's a language that I'm trying to take out of my own mouth as well. You can't, you can't just say you are busy and there are important things that you are leaving undone and they're just letting them to slide, especially our relationship in our family setting. And the Lord will help us to be healthy in body as we are strong in the spirit. In the name of Jesus, let us rise up.